All right, it might take just a few to uh, a little bit of a delay. And we are live, so it should be on right now. So, hey, everybody, welcome to the NASCAR Live Chat with Ham, the Engine Man. And I have my guest with me today, Dawn Clark. Hi, everybody. Well, hey there, Dawn. How are you today? I'm good, David. How are you? It's so good to see you, as always. I love being here. It's my first time. You know, we were in, in the, the new uh, studio. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. Hold on. Say that again. It's my first time since you all officially opened oh. to be in the new studio. Okay, so you have you uh, okay seen our drum set and all that kind of oh, stuff yeah, set I've up? Seen all that. I okay. got to climb up. I'm yes. Not supposed to tell. This, oh, I, I, guess, I got to. Yes. No, I, I've toured the building. Yeah, I did the same thing. Yep. And I didn't, but I didn't make it all the way to the top. Did you make it all the way to the top? Not the big ladder. No. No. Okay. <laughs> Scared of heights. All right. So hopefully everybody can hear us very well and everything is working good. I see we have some comments already from the uh, soapbox or whatever. The uh, Tracy says, where's Johnny? And I know, <laughs> I think that means uh, where am I? Because I was supposed to be on here already. But, you know, I'm always a little bit late. It's kind of like one of those things. It's the anticipation of waiting on me, I guess you could say. No, not really. But uh, so I was trying to get on here to where I can see comments on my phone. But... I'm going to have to... I can see comments on my phone. Oh, can you? You can okay. tell me what you want to say. Yeah, go ahead and say, read the comments. Read what everybody's saying. And I'm going to send a text. All right, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to send a text to our buddy, John Bryan, who uh, he's going to do a phone in. And he was a jack man for many years for different people. And I'll let him tell his story. But he was the jack man before I was. Hmm. And whenever I was working at the dealership, he was the parts guy. And he got the call from Ricky Rudd that says, do you want to come work for me full time and be my parts guy? And the Jackman, of course. So that was about around 19, uh, let's see, 93 or so. Yes. That was about two years before I okay. got into the NASCAR thing. Yeah, yeah, so you got in close to the time I did. I was about in 95. 90, yes. Yeah. I got in the end of the 94 season. And uh, so the, uh, that was back in the day in Charlotte. And so so when you were, all right, so Dawn's going to, she was a, what was your position in? in so can I? Can I tell you a little bit about like how I got into all Yeah, this? absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So I was a banker in Charlotte at a private bank, mm -hmm. and I had a customer who was going to start a Bush Grand National team in 1995, and he wanted his son, who was 25, to be the driver. And he was running late models out at Concord, and I went out there to watch him race one night, and J.D. Gibbs ran into the back of his car at Concord during a heat race, and... Neil, my friend's whole car exploded. Oh, wow. And JD actually pulled him out of the car. Okay. And Neil wasn't wearing any gloves. And he was driving the car. He was driving the car okay. at Concord. Wow. He had third degree burns on both of his hands. Um, and that's how I got to be really good friends with their whole family. And then they started a race team the next year, but Neil couldn't drive at that point mm -hmm. because his hands were still, he had three different skin grafts, third degree oh my burns. Gosh. It was really, really bad. So did you find out why he didn't have any gloves on? Well, you know, it was just one of those Saturday night late model races where everybody got behind and he just jumped in the car. But when you try to get one of those five point harnesses, yeah, you know, undone and a ball of fire oh, and you're yeah. not wearing any no max it's bad not so, good so i became really good friends with their family and they started a bush grand national team in late 95 and i worked with them as their scorer until and their scorer and their banker yeah um until almost 2000 i guess okay so i used to go to the racetrack every weekend we were joking earlier on the uh, wame radio feed uh with some of my friends on here of course dickie dennis and uh steve baker and Tracy, and we were joking about, uh, I was telling her that you were going to be on here, and I said she was a scorer. I wonder if she scored going to the racetrack is what I was saying. So <laughs> I said I was going to have to ask you. I was, I was totally kidding. I course. looked so different than everybody else at the racetrack because a lot of times I'd have to come like after work and I'd still be in my banker clothes. And I remember Chip Warren, one of the officials, used to give me a hard time saying, you're the only person who doesn't look like they belong here. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> you don't look like you belong. Well, that's real nice. <laughs> Here's your restrictor plate. You don't really look uh, like you belong here at Daytona yes. today, Don. So my st yeah. I have a story to go along with that one. And, it, and mine actually started out somewhat similar, but I was going to Concord probably about 1989, 1990. 
and uh, I was there when one of my friends that I went to college with down in Charlotte at Central Piedmont Community College, we were in the Automotive Service Educational Program, ASAP mm-hmm. for short, and to be automotive service technicians. Both of us wanted to get a job in NASCAR. So he was friends with someone that worked on Stanton Barrett's car. Oh, and Yeah, and Stanton. When he, he was alternating between being the stuntman yes. and being the driver. Yeah, and his dad was also a stuntman. Yeah, but yes, but Stanton, one. yeah, the junior, I guess you call him, he was also doing the stunts and, and, and things. And so he was, uh, you know, cause he was kind of a big deal. So I was like, wow, this guy, you know. And uh, so, and he was wanting to get into, Stanton was wanting to get in NASCAR too. But we went out to Concord Speedway. And I just helped out with his car, you know, tightening bolts and crawling underneath it and this kind of stuff. And he was sponsored by Wendy's. And I knew Dale Jr.'s uh, crew chief. I had been friends with him for several years at that point. And, and I didn't know Tony Erie Jr., but I knew Tony Erie Sr. So when we had an engine issue with that car, we had water. We took the drain plug out of the engine, and there was just nothing but water pouring out. So I was like, okay. Well, let's go find Tony, Tony, scene, Tony, or, you know, whatever. So somebody who knows something about what's going on. Yeah. It's kind of funny looking back now. And I'm like, then I end up being the engine builder in NASCAR, you know? And when I got into NASCAR, I wasn't sure exactly I was going to be an engine builder, but, uh, that's just kind of what the way that things fell into place because I ended up getting an interview, you know, a few years later with Barry Dodson on the car side. And then I ended up, let's see, who else did I get an interview with? Oh, Jeff Hammond. Uh-huh. Yeah. So and so I ended up getting a job over Sapco. But that, that's enough about me. I just thought that was a similar story with the Concord thing. You know, what year was you going out to Concord Speedway? The night of the big fire was September 30th, 1995. I okay. remember it like it was yesterday. All right. But Neil, when he after he recovered, he went back to late model racing, so I'm out at Concord. So mm-hmm. we did that for a while. He was also doing the Hooters Pro Cup Series when that was running, yes. like, when we weren't running in the Bush series. So. Yes, I remember that that Hooters Pro Cup series. So uh, Tom Robinson's tuned in. He says, same thing uh, about you, Mrs. Ham. I'm not sure. They had a conversation going earlier. Chad Hyder's in. Chad Hyder's in Ohio. Dickie Dennis up in Virginia. Tom's up in uh, Indiana. Steve He's, Baker's yelling at somebody's cat. Steve <laughs> Steve Baker says some guy named Tony. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at my my computer from way over here. I feel like these are all my friends that yeah. I read comments with every time yeah. you guys are on the radio. Not oh. just this show, but like all of your shows. I feel like I know who these people are. Yeah, you know what? It's funny because Dawn has actually been tuning in here lately. Um, Dawn and Liz, uh, from the comfort of your porch, I guess. Well, no, now we can watch it on my big TV because I have the YouTube oh, app. Yeah, absolutely. So I wonder if Liz is tuned in. I don't think she's got the YouTube app on her TV. She's oh. going to have to go next door to me. She needs to get with it. You know, welcome to the 20th century there. <laughs> I always joke about that. I realize she's it's the 21st. She's right now. She'll be happy you said her name on the radio. Yes. Well, Liz Petrie, she's making chicken for Jason. Her husband. Yes. A.K.A. Governor Vance. <laughs> oh, <is> yes. It, <laughs> that's not what you were going to say. <laughs> Turd Ferguson. <laughs> Yes, or Turd Ferguson. He has that same personality as Turd Ferguson in, in the Saturday Night Live yes, skits. Yes, he does. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to bring one of those big hats in that we have from our Chillbillies Parade and put that hat on him, and we're going to redo that skit. We've been thinking about doing that. What's up, Mike Bear? Oh, he says, hello, everyone. And so, uh, <laughs> all right. WAME Radio says hi somehow. Really? Like, how did that happen? I don't know, but that's good. Did you say hi to hey. yourself just now, Dave? uh no i did not i'm not t- i'm not actually logged in on there anything so yes hi hey to you too so liz dinner is ready oh so oh, we're invited on, liz. we are invited for dinner we'll we'll get a takeout order <laughs> can you bring my bourbon when you come to please uh so dicky says i'm gonna have some ice cream anybody wants some uh i got a little story to go with that i had i actually was it last night yeah mother's day we had some uh we had spaghetti and some kind of chicken some alfredo and you know that's like carb overload and so i didn't usually right after that i end up taking a nap but i had a customer call and i did have a beer or two and i had a customer call and said hey you know i got some flooding going on in my basement can you uh our real estate agent said you might be able to help with that so i said all right i'll, I'll go take care of it so i ended up running out there but on the way back i had to stop and get me some ice cream 
and I got some uh, butter pecan ice cream, and it was one of those little tubs. But you know, I ate the whole thing, of course. I you mean, it's just pecan? a little tub. Pecan, yeah. Was it pecan? I say pecan. Pecan. Oh, well, that's that's but close. But other people say. I mean, yeah. I've lived. I'm a sixth generation Statesville person, okay. so it's not like butter I, pecan. Butter pecan. Yeah, that's good. It's it's when people but I say, don't say pecan. No, when people say pecan, I'm like, you're not from around here, are you? No, <laughs> At all. I say that too. Yes. So, uh, sixth generation Statesvillian. How about yes. that? I'm from Charlotte originally. My great grandfather played in the Statesville band back. Hmm. He was also the sheriff. Really? Uh huh. Oh wow. But they used to rehearse like on the second or third floor up here. I can't remember which floor it was. On this in this building. In this building. Clock Tower building. Okay. Yeah, because when I was up there a couple of months ago, there's still some band uniforms up there, and I actually have a picture in oh, my yes. house of my great grandfather in. One of the band okay. uniforms that's up there. I was so. wondering what that uniform was for. I thought it was like a guard or something, because they're up there. There's like a cabinet, and there's some, and the hats are like completely yeah. wore out with well, holes they in all and stuff. Wore, I mean, they look like little, like almost <laughs> army uniforms. Yeah. Oh, Steve's weighing in. Yeah, he said, uh, yeah, pecan, peak can, yes. Uh, Terry says I'm eating uh, taco chips and refried beans. Oh, I love that refried beans. Yes, that's some good stuff right there. Uh, Nancy Davidson, good to see you on here. She says we say pecan in South Carolina. Very good. I don't. I don't see. Uh, let's see. Who do I not see? Scott Trevison, beer man, or any of the uh, Rodriguez kit. I don't see any of those on here. So maybe they'll join us. I don't know. I didn't get the link out till a little bit later, but we are going to talk a little bit about NASCAR. But I'm not going to really? follow really a script. I'm just going to kind of go. <laughs> really, with, we're going to talk about NASCAR. Yeah, maybe just a little bit. Uh, just some of the things, you know, going on in NASCAR, some of the highlights. Let's see. And then Brad Kozlowski's Checker Flag Foundation is honored to support the Mitchell Community College Officer Jordan Sheldon, Sheldon. Memorial Scholarship Fund. Do you remember that what we did for him last year at uh, the Tom Dilley Fund? Yes, Day? I do. Yes. That and that was really was awesome. The anniversary of that, well, it was a couple of days ago. Yeah. And we, I saw that flashed up on my, on my uh, Facebook page as a memory. So it's a, a obviously a program honoring a hero, helping shape the future of our heroes. He was a officer that was killed in Mooresville about a year ago. So it's the newly anniversary of that. And Steve Baker, sir, Steve Baker is also an officer, so he could definitely uh, relate to that. So Nancy Davidson, where is Rachel Rodman? She actually sent me a text and said that she was going to have to work. She had way too much going on. So she's not going to be able to join us tonight. So I'm going to send our buddy John Bryan a text and tell him to call. Maybe he'll call in. Not, I mean, you know, we got enough entertainment here with Dawn, of course. <laughs> oh yeah, that's. But you know, uh, <laughs> but it's always good to have extra folks on here, because like I said, John Bryan's been in NASCAR for he he was in NASCAR for a long time, and he quit to he did his own landscaping business. He actually quit when he first got out of NASCAR he was doing some stuff with Jeff Clark I don't know if you know Jeff Clark mm -hmm. with this this motorcycle business the stuff they had going on and then uh so now he's uh, doing landscaping All, I think it's uh it's called American Lawn and Landscape is the name of his business so he'll send me some work my way every once in a while if there's a bush hog job that requires a big tractor or such then I end up doing that stuff so I'll tell you a quick story so in 1996 Six and seven, I helped start a new community bank here in Statesville called Piedmont Bank hmm. down on East Front Street. That sounds familiar, Piedmont. Yep. They had an office in Mooresville over on Williamson Road, like in the <laughs> middle of Lakeside Park. Yes. And back then, I mean, NASCAR was really, really big in Mooresville back in that day. Yes. And there was there none of the loan officers, sorry, the law, it was, none of the loan officers <laughs> in the bank knew anything about NASCAR, mm -hmm. and that was when I was working for the team part time on the weekends, and so they would. It was uh, Race City USA back then. Yeah, and yeah. they would take me along on these ca these calls mm -hmm. to loan people money because I'd say, "Do you know what a body hanger does?" Yeah, and they'd be like, <laughs> "What's a body hanger?" I've no that I'm sounds like, Please morbid. Just take me with you so that you don't look like idiots when you go in to talk to these NASCAR people because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you needed to know something about their business. Yes. And that was a business that nobody in Statesville really knew anything about. About body hanging. 
body hanging, yeah. engine building. I mean, all that right. stuff. People yeah, because know about that stuff. I know we moved up from uh, Charlotte in 96, but well, actually we moved the shop in, uh, yeah, it was right at the beginning of 96, but I, I actually uh, packed up my family and moved up here in 96 to the Mooresville area because of our race shop moving up here. Dickie says, uh, well, Terry says Jeff Clark and John Bryan, Robert Yates Racing. That's, that is correct. And Nancy says, I always wanted to drive a backhoe. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. Okay. Yeah, I wanted you said to... you were out driving backhoes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big equipment and stuff, yes. And then uh, Steve Baker says, I wanted to drive a, a tow truck when I was a kid. There you go. It's good to set goals and, and go for it, you know. I mean, no matter what it is. <laughs> if you want to be a, a trash truck or tra whatever, be the best one out there that there is. I just That's want somebody to say. come and bring mulch to my house at this point. That's really all I want. Oh, to deliver mulch. Well, well, I believe I know someone whose last name is Ham. I was going to say the younger I, Ham that yeah. could probably help me out. With yes, that. you just need you need it delivered. You need it put out because I can do both. I think Jason I just, Petrie could probably help me oh, put out that mulch. There you Tyler go. Tyler Ham could just deliver me. Yes, some. he can deliver, and it's not with it's within their range, so it won't cost you a whole lot to uh, no, get it delivered. I mean, it's like, a mile away. Yes, <laughs> right. Okay, so the the uh, so some of the things, other things going on. Voting for the NASCAR Hall of Fame is postponed due to the coronavirus. Voting is normally held May the twentieth, the week of the Coke Six Hundred in Charlotte. The uh, twenty twenty one NASCAR schedule will not be released until July due to the COVID nineteen. The schedule, which is expected to have significant changes to types of races and the track, was to be released in April. I think that they should do some of these Wednesday night races. Mm -hmm. They need to go ahead and just plan on start doing that. Yep. Because, you know, they're going to do that next week. So that Hall of Fame class, mm -hmm. is Kirk Shelmerdine on that list? You know, I, I, I don't think so. Is he? I think he is. Oh, I don't know about all and that. And I was trying to, like, I don't really remember that much about Kirk Shelmerdine. That somebody I'm supposed to. Uh, well, I Kurt, mean, I remember his name. So yeah, Kirk Shelmerding was a, he was a crew chief for for Earnhardt over at Richard Childress Racing for a while. Um, then after he he also drove on the number three car. You mean? Yes, on a three car, and he also drove some in the Sportsman series. You remember the Sportsman cars? The first race they, I ever got to stand out on yes. pit road at Charlotte was the Sportsman race in 1995 oh, before yeah, the before okay, the 95. Open and before the. Yes. Winston, yeah. yeah, they were very dangerous. Yes, they were. Uh, there was a lot of Russell Phillips. Actually, he was oh. one of the drivers that got killed, and he was yeah, I that. got that up was, on the fence like a cheese grater. That was like the next year. Yeah, it was bad. That was very bad. Really bad deal. So the the Sportsman Series ended up going away. They had you know drivers like Robbie Faggart, who was from out of Concord. He drove for us. That's what I was thinking. That you said you mentioned to me about. We had Robbie we Faggart. fielded two cars one year yep. at Charlotte, and he drove one, and Nathan Buckey drove the other. Okay, and I remember was, the name that name too, Nathan his, Buckey. Yeah, his parents were dairy farmers. Uh, what's up? Oh, dairy farmers. Okay, mm -hmm. Hubert uh, Hobble Cobble Hobble Cobby. Sorry about that. If I butchered that name, uh, it says Manchester. Uh, so yeah. All right. So uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to get you. Up. No, no, no. You're fine. We, we were talking about Robbie Fager. Now I wonder what Robbie Fager is doing nowadays. We don't hear his name anymore. He was wide open. Wide open. We picked him up off of the Concord late model track to drive for us. And, I mean, both of those cars qualified that year. It wasn't that bad, but yeah. it was, he was something else. Yeah. That's all I can say. I'm sure. Wasn't he a school teacher? He was. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had a couple of kids and, you know, he was, yeah. I remember these little things about drivers and I remember their car numbers. I don't remember his number though, but I just remember all these little things popping in my really head. He didn't really drive that many bush races. I mean, we just picked him because we had built two cars for Charlotte and we needed somebody to drive one because Nathan was driving the other one. But And then then we got Hank Parker Jr. Oh, yeah, Hank Parker Jr. And that was mm -hmm. quite an experience. And he, wrote, he drove at Concord also. And let's see. Hank, Hank drove a lot of different – his dad mm -hmm. was pretty instrumental in getting him into a lot of places. Sure. Because he still had his big fishing show and stuff back then. So. Yeah. I was uh, – I got to be pretty decent friends with him. Through working in NASCAR, yeah. And uh, and then I would go over and talk to him about, hey, do you want us to build engines for you next year? And this kind of stuff, you know, trying to do a little politicking, I guess you could say. But uh, it seems like he was – one year when we were leaving Kansas, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the race he won. It just seems like it. Whatever reason, like I said, all these things pop in my head. 
Uh, Nancy says, my dad used to have a John Deere lawnmower. I mowed our backyard and somehow it ended up looking like a small oval track. Uh, <laughs> grass was still high outside and inside of the track. Yeah, we we get to talk about all kinds of different things, but that's what's good about this show. We can just talk about whatever we want to talk about and carry on. It's laid back. Just have a good time. Talk with some fellow race fans because that's what we're here for. We all love the sport of NASCAR. Even though it's changed quite a bit, it's not the same as it was back then, but it is what it is. All right, so Chad says, as it should be, Nancy, as it should be. We're talking about, uh, <laughs> yes, outside and inside of the track. And then, uh, yes, Kirk Shelmerdine is in the NASCAR Hall of Fame ballot. Yeah, I thought I saw him on Terry the ballot Quinn. today. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I did my research before I came. Very good. I was afraid you might ask me hard questions. Oh, I, I'm not going to put you on the spot like that. If I was going to do that, I would probably tell you ahead of time. I was afraid you were going to ask me about North Wilkesboro, and as cool as I thought it was that they did that, yep. I did not have a chance to. I know. I haven't watched it yet either, and I was planning to, and I just hadn't got around to it. So, um, Wilkesboro, I was there for the last race. I was the Jackman for Kyle Petty. Apparently, they re-showed that race on TV the other day, but nobody, I didn't get any calls or texts about it because there was a spot where I, like, grabbed my headset, and I'm like, it won't go up <laughs> on TV. You mean in the race? Either in the race, yes. Because I came around to the left side of the car. It was Kyle Petty's, and I threw the jack down, and it goes thunk right into the side of the car. It would not – all right, so – I didn't cut the stop before the race. The stop was like an inch long. And so that was for, I learned my lesson right there to always cut that jack stop completely off and put a piece of tape right there. So I know where the jack needs to go. So there, that was my, uh, Wilkes Barre story. So from then on, we had to uh, actually use a, a bar to lift the car up on the left side. When I would come around, I'd kind of have to dodge. And then the, there would be somebody there with a long pry, pry bar, Lifting a car up to where I could get Jack under. But, yeah, those pieces of tape are there for a strategic reason because you certainly don't want to forget um, or you don't want to not be able to get your Jack sub in it. So, John Bryan's getting ready to call here in just a minute, it looks like. He just sent me a text back. I told him it would be about quarter till or 8 o'clock or so. And so, yes, uh, let's see what else we got going on. Uh, the schedule is expecting that. Yeah, I already read that. According to Adam Stern of Sports Business, no money changes hands between NASCAR Racing, iRacing, and Fox Sports to put on the Pro Invitational Series. Apparently, they're doing that for free, just to bring the uh, bringing the fans together with the iRacing thing. Which I'm kind of over it. You know, I watched I watched a little bit of the iRacing, but it's, to me, it's just not the same, obviously, as the real thing. So I wasn't a, a big fan of it. I think it was great that they did it, and I think it was good to keep the uh, sponsors involved and stuff, but I also saw some of the drama that came along with it, and I didn't like that. Hey, what's up, Tay Childers? You know Tater? He's tuned in. I do not. Yes, he's the, the kid that plays. He's nine years old now. He just had his birthday, and we're going to get him in here on the stage to play his oh, guitar. I've heard, yes, I've heard about him. Yes. That's right. It's very good, very good. Uh, he was very impressive. We went had the uh, Thumb Pickers convention down here. Mm -hmm. And he got down there and was playing with Clay Lunsford and David Johnson. And he was looking over and, like, nodding, telling them it's their turn. So, very good. Very talented young I man. I may have seen a clip of him. Yeah, and I, and I took the uh, 65 T-Bird over to uh, his birthday party, the drive-by. So, I sat out there and in the car, and he came over and got his picture with him. All right, there's Paul Rodriguez down in Florida. But, yeah, Tay, thanks for tuning in, buddy. And we will see you soon. We're going to get you in here. And uh, Paul said, oops, with, I'm sorry I'm late. He is down in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Oh, nice. Yes. So how nice is Can that? Can we come visit soon? Yeah. <laughs> we haven't been out in the States, though. Oh, my gosh. I know. We're, we're going to Florida in, in next month, about a, right at a month from now. Tracy, uh, send Scott Travis and, this, uh, and Jana so they can tune in and see what's up down from down in Florida. They need to be uh, tuning in here right now. Because I know Scott, he sent me a picture yesterday. He was watching the iRace. I think it was out on his boat or something like that. He's got his uh, nice boat down there and, and uh, keeps it in the waters of Daytona area. And so, yeah, he goes out fishing as much as he wants to. Really nice. So, Steve Phelps of NASCAR sees Darlington as an opportunity, and I agree with that. Due to the NASCAR being the first sport to return to the U.S., U.S. sports. And also, they were, they're going to be the only ones on TV playing sports. Think about it. 
that's kind of like back in the uh, 1979 Daytona 500 days when everybody was snowed in their house. Mm. They were watching that race. It was the first live telecast, live action from Daytona. Ever. And I remember watching it when I was a I kid. I, I watched it live action. I was 30 years old when I went to my first NASCAR race, even though I grew up here. I went to the Winston. I oh. had never been before. And when they dropped that checkered flag, all the little hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And I'm like, yeah. I love this so much. Oh, the Winston. Was it the night race, the first night race no. or the, the day race? 89 still? was, I okay. think it was the last day yeah. race because it was Davy Allison was... 89, okay. Yeah, it was the Davy Allison year. Yeah, I was thinking that one was, uh, or maybe it was a little bit rainy. No, this was not rainy. Okay. Is it 89 or 90? Now, I, I could be confused, too. It might have been 91. I think the first night race, if I'm not mistaken, was 92. It was 92. Okay. So, 91 may have been the one that uh, it was kind of a little bit drizzly rainy that day. But, yes, I went to all those races, too. Uh, or back to all star races. That was a long day and a long time getting out of the parking lot. Oh, yeah, absolutely was. Yes. But and I that, can't imagine having these races now with no spectators in the stands. Oh, I know. It's going to be I weird. Mean, I just, but I, it is. I had a couple of occasions over the years where I've gotten to go and sit in the suites in Charlotte just with different business things. And I hated it. I was like, I have to go sit outside. I mean, yeah. if you can't hear it and smell it, it is not like being. At a NASCAR race. Right. You got to have that fuel smell. You got to yeah. have that tire smell. And you got to have that rumble of the engines for sure. So, yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. So, I'm going to I'm gonna tell. Venezuela. All right. Go ahead and tell another story. We're, I've got stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text John back because he's texting me about I'm starting to calling run out in of and stories. stuff. <laughs> all right. So, have you been to Wilkesboro? Uh, never for a race. Because no. the last year we raced there was in 96. So, and that was the last, that was my first time there and my last time there. I was actually working for First Union one year and had tickets. And then some, I don't, maybe the race got rained out. For some reason, I couldn't go. That was probably like 91 or 92. Oh, okay. 91, 92. Yeah. So, you know what? I always liked the, uh, it was still the Holly Farms. The, okay. Yes. Or whatever. Probably. Right. Holly Farms race. Uh, we were talking about the All Star race at Charlotte. I always liked, I loved the way that they had the um, one hot night. Ugh. And it was always know. the moon. And the weather was always perfect. Yep. It just seemed. All right. So here we go. Hey, what's up, buddy? Hey, man. How you doing? Good. How you doing, John? All I'm right. Doing good, man. How about yourself, David? Doing good, man. Doing good. It's, so we got John Bryan on the phone. And uh, me and John go way back. So did you get that link I sent for your wife to see? I know. Yes, I was, she is. Yeah. I was a little bit late on that. But, yes. So I also have Dawn Clark in here with me. And she was a – what. Would you say hey, a scorer? I was a scorer. Yes, so she was a scorer. It was a glamorous job. You got to count laps and write them down on a piece of paper. Right. <laughs> John, we've known plenty of those scorers in the past, right? We were the hot women. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Couldn't do it without them, right? All right. Yep. So, so, John, tell us a little bit about your history, your uh, how you got started in NASCAR. Before we came on, I was telling you, I was telling everybody about uh, whenever I worked with you at the dealership. <laughs> We worked at Reed Oldsmobile, sure. and then I said that I the one day you got the phone call from Ricky Rudd that said, hey, you want to come and work for me full time? And that's when you, mm -hmm. but you had yeah. already been in NASCAR before that. Right, right. I, I had I had uh, worked in NASCAR part time, you know, but I had still, like I said, worked at the dealership uh, and stuff. And I actually worked at uh, Liberty Pontiac down the road before I came, you know, to Reed Oldsmobile. Mm -hmm. So, um uh, you know, I kind of made the transition, but yeah, my first full-time job was when, uh, in 94, uh, which was, you know, a while back, but yeah, that was, uh, I started out with Ricky Rudd when he left, um, Hendrick Motorsports and started his own, um, his own team. So we, uh, it kind of went from there. It was, uh, it was a wild ride. You know, it, uh, it seemed like it all kind of happened at once, you know, it just mm -hmm. took off and, the next thing you know, I was in it for, uh, you know, full time for 10 years um, and then got out of it and just went on to new ventures. But, you know, love, love the racing, love the racing, no doubt. Yeah, for sure. So you were with the, um, from what I, from my memory tells me you were with the, uh, with 57, Heinz 57. Weren't you with that car at some point? 
Um, I had actually, uh, I, I did not work on Spencer's car on the 57. I actually worked with him when he came over and was driving for Bobby Allison, uh, mm-hmm. motorsports and started driving the, at the time, Meineke, uh, came on the, it was the black and yellow car. Uh, if people remember it was the uh, number 12, uh, that was Bobby's car. Hut Strickland had drove it. It was a Ray Bestus, um, car at the time it was blue. They had changed sponsors and stuff, but uh, I never worked at with Jimmy there. But I had jacked a couple of cars that he had drove, um, and Bush and then Cup, mm-hmm. you know, just like a one one time deal. You know what I'm talking about? So. Yeah, I got you. I was uh, actually texting with Hut earlier today about uh, getting him to come into the studio, but he said hey, he is covered up, and you know he's actually working on well, moving and stuff like that. So he's trying to sell his house. But it's like, oh, okay, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, it's up for sale, and um, he's got a place down there. He's wanting to uh, eventually head down a little bit further south of here, so that's kind of the plan for him. But one of these days, I'll get him in here, okay. as well as getting you in here. And <laughs> I'd like to get you in here with uh, Beer Man with Scott Trevison, who. Oh gosh, yes, oh that uh, <laughs> uh, that that's, that could be something. That could <laughs> there, be, yeah. That that would be good, yeah, yeah. You need to get Scott to come on up um, from from Florida and yeah. come see us up here. So yeah, for sure. So, yeah, Florida. man, it was uh, it was good times in racing. We uh, uh, talking about you know her that's there to score. I you know I don't even know if they even do they even score cars like that anymore. I mean, is there do you do they even have a score? I don't know. You know, back then there was still like the transpond. I mean, the car still had transponders. There was definitely a computerized scoring, but we were just there to right. do the backups on paper just in case something went wrong with one of the cars. Because I guess if you wreck a car that has a transponder mm. on it, you may not know how many laps that car is finished. I don't know. I never got sure. the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. I I'd never, love to know if yeah. they still do it. Uh, it was really nice because yeah. we got to sit inside in the air conditioning. Yes, absolutely. I, I I remember a couple of times uh, the air conditioner went out. I, I don't know. I remember uh, our two scorers, they were telling us as we were getting on the plane after the race, they uh, said the air conditioner had been out like halfway through the race. It was at Talladega uh, when we used to race down there in July. And the girls, I mean, the girls, they all had their, they all had their hair up. You know, it was so, they were soaking wet. You know, we were like, what is wrong with y'all? And they're like, the air conditioner went out and it, Oh, it was I it was I hilarious! Been but there that weekend, because that scoring booth was in the middle of the infield. It wasn't like up, like at Bristol. Yeah. It was, oh, what? Yeah, talking to microphone. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, you're fine. At so, Bristol, you know, you get to sit up way high and watch everything. But at Talladega, it was in the infield mm-hmm. back then. So yeah, it was hot. Yeah, yeah, hot. yeah, I remember they had y'all stuck in a little block building with a big glass on the front, and it was like two stories there where y'all could sit, the kind of a upper and lower deck there, and uh, and you were right in the middle, right behind, I guess, pit road a little bit all, off the side of the garage. Yeah, and that's where you guys were. And that, that uh, building, it, it is it still there? I, I, I can see if the air conditioner went out, how y'all would melt. Oh, it was <laughs> terrible. Do y'all remember flying into <laughs> Talladega and we landed so hard that all the oxygen masks fell down? <laughs> you remember that, John? I do. I do remember that. I, I remember actually, uh, funny story real quick i remember flying in the very first time we ever got to fly into talladega uh, and we landed they tried to land a little bit closer uh, at the airport uh, right there at the racetrack instead of in anniston down the road Mm -hmm. so they they tried to fly in and they made it but when they were coming back taxiing uh, to turn around they blew all the windows out uh, Mm -hmm. in the tower at the airport and apparently blew the windows out in the bathrooms and stuff. Um, and there was a lot, of, there were a lot of race people that it were, were in the bathroom, you know, when the windows <laughs> got blown out. And so there was, um, quite a few, uh, funny stories out of that. So, uh, that I just remember doing that. We were already gone. Someone had already come and p- picked us up to take us to the racetrack. But those were the people that were left behind that, you know, were still waiting on their rides to the <laughs> infield. <laughs> yes. And it blew all the windows out. I mean, all of them. <laughs> I, I mean, crazy. every one of them. Yeah. So they had to, 
uh, either moved the tower or put the runway over a little bit or something. They made some kind of adjustment, and uh, we were good to go from there. But that's that's uh, something I remember from Talladega. Yeah, I remember that because I wasn't actually – I remember being somewhere else when that happened. I guess we'd already took off or already gone to the track or whatever. Whenever that, sure. yeah. Um, and then, uh, well, you know, always it was always seemed like something crazy would happen at Talladega, you know, because the the president of ARCA, was, I think Iraq or ARCA, one of these, I think it was the ARCA president had gotten killed. He got run over outside the track. It was like there there was a runway where you're oh, really? going yeah. to go and enter the track, and uh, yeah, he got run over. Um, and then, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> that was back that. then. That was probably 97, 98, somewhere in that range. I drove myself to Talladega. Oh, yeah. Down uh, Highway 22, oh 85 to 22. It's like, yeah. Like in the middle yeah. of nowhere. Oh, yeah. It was tough. Yeah, it was definitely. <laughs> and and, uh, and then whenever we'd take <laughs> off from Talladega to come back home, we'd always – well, I remember flying over Atlanta when they had the World Series going on. And you, and you could see That's the cool. uh, the World Series down there in the Oh, backfields. very neat. Mm-hmm. That's neat. Yeah. So one of the That's things neat. about uh, John uh, John Bryan and uh, Brian Clark, you know, it seems like we were always waiting on those guys on the race to express plane to get back. <laughs> so after <laughs> the race, what airport did you fly out of? Uh, out of what? Out of what airport Anderson? did you fly out of to go? To well, back 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 Charlotte. then, at the time, we um, they they weren't allowing us. You know, Concord at the time was strictly just private. Mm-hmm. Um, they were not doing any kind of commercial flights. Plus, we we always ha- we always flew out of um, Signature down in Charlotte because that's where Robert at the time was keeping his planes. So mm-hmm. um, we either flew Race Day Express or I flew on Robert's plane. Um, he had two smaller uh, planes. They were uh, man, I can't remember. I think they were like Beechcrafts. I think the name of the plane. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were prop planes, you know, but they would probably see eight or nine of us, uh, in there. And then sometimes of course we flew the race day express. Um, very seldom did I ever fly out of Concord right. um, where most of them do, I think now. Yeah. So, now. Um, so. yeah, but you know, that was, uh, another thing we were kind of the maiden voyage, um, for the race day express. So we were part of uh, I guess the year of working out all the kinks. So there's so many stories of, of, of having to stay back. And I literally I slept in an airport, you know, in San Francisco because the plane broke down. We flew out the next morning. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, red eyes because planes were late and, or had to have crews on the ground, you know, for so long. And so it was just crazy stuff that we worked out the, you know, the first couple of years while mm-hmm. we were, uh, doing that that race day, that was, uh, so it was uh, quite an yeah, adventure. It was, was it DK Ulrich's uh, Diane? Was the lady? Yeah, uh, Diane. And, mm-hmm. uh, she yeah. was in charge. So yeah, we we uh, actually in San Francisco. I remember Sammy Hagar being there at the airport, hmm. uh, but I didn't get to see him. But I just remember the other guys saying that. And then their battery was dead in the airplane or something. So they said, "Yeah, Ty Norris, give us uh, some money," and said, "Here, y'all go have a good time." So I got to experience a little more of San Francisco. That night, I used to think he was O'Farrell's. the prettiest man in all of NASCAR. Oh, you did, Ty Norris. Ty, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was our general manager <laughs> over at uh, Sabco. I remember. Yeah, yeah, I remember Ty Norris. I sure do. I, I actually remember Ty Norris. <clears throat> we actually worked for Winston. You know, he worked for NASCAR or yeah. the Winston brand, either one. I remember he did a lot of stuff in Victory Lane before he yeah, ever went. He did. You know, and worked for Felix, and so. um yeah, it's, man, it's been a long time since I've seen Ty Norris. Yeah, he kind of, uh, whenever, whenever that deal he's went He's still down, in racing? I mean, well, he's he, still. The, the deal went down with Michael Waltrip. He was kind of in on that whenever, mm-hmm. you know, he made the call to. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. He was still the prettiest that's man right. in NASCAR. <laughs> last time I saw him was at, <laughs> yeah, he, last, last time I saw him was at a base, <laughs> baseball field. My son was playing travel ball. And Ty Norris's kids were there playing too, and that was down in Huntersville. And that's the last time I seen him, and we talked for a little bit about. When is the next place. time the Scott's coming up here? Uh, he he is supposed you to know? be. Uh, he's supposed to be coming up. We're going down there before he comes back here. The last time I talked to him, okay. made, well, I talked to him yesterday, but I said, "When are you coming back?" And he said, "Well, after you come down here." And I was like, "Okay, is he joking with me or what?" But I ended up going. We're going down the middle of next month. 
And so then we'll mm -hmm. uh, then I guess he's going to come back up after that. But I thought he he made it sound like he was coming back really soon. So you never know with him. He might wake up tomorrow morning and decide he's going to come back up here. And you're so, exactly right. And tomorrow afternoon at six o'clock he'll be here. Right. Yeah. That's how, that's how Scott is. Mm -hmm. You just really don't know. <laughs> yep. yep. And you then, do not know with Scott. No. And a lot of times it's just uh, if he's got a doctor's appointment or whatever, he'll come. He'll get in his car and come back up here. So. Uh, I don't know if you remember Terry Quinn. She was a huge Robert Yates racing fan back in the day. And she knows, like, whenever I was talking about you and uh, Jeff Clark, she said, yep, uh, John Bryan, Jeff Clark over at Robert Yates Racing. And so, yeah, so we got some people tuned in on YouTube. I don't know if your wife's still okay. watching or whatever, but, you know, like Paul Rodriguez. Is, I have no idea. Is Ty Norris related to Chuck Norris? Chuck Norris, oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's, that's probably sounds like a Steve Baker. Or Love that. Dickie Dennis comment, yeah. <laughs> We got some, That's pretty good. Yeah, we like got that. some we got some pretty funny characters on yeah, here. Yeah, Terry Quinn. Terry Quinn. That name sounds from that name sounds familiar. Yeah. Um, oh, name Paul sounds Rodriguez. familiar. Yeah, she's out in uh, Berkeley. But, um, yeah, that's great, man. That's great. Yeah. What about you? Talk about you. You were you jack race cars too. I know you've been talking about well, yourself. Okay, so whenever we, uh, I remember sitting on an airplane with you one time, and we were saying, you looked at me and we we're like, you know what? How cool is this? He's like, you know, would you ever thought? that here you are, Jack Mann for Kyle Petty, and I'm Jack Mann for mm -hmm. Ernie I think you said Ernie Irvin. I don't remember. I'm trying to remember. Mm -hmm. Would it have been Ernie? Or it was Ernie or, Irvin at the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and so here we are, you know, traveling together and this kind of stuff. So, you know, that was cool. That was one of those memories that I, that I hold on to. Uh, because before that, I was like, all right, I'm working at dealership. I'm a dealership technician. I went through college. I wanted to be – I wanted to get into NASCAR. I wanted to be a Jack Mann. So, you know, I spent that – let's say a whole year that I really worked out every morning going to the gym. And I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then you get the call and say, Hey, you want to come work for me full time, which you were already a Jack man at the time. Uh, but the, mm -hmm. you know, but that, that kind of just like inspired me. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. So then when I did it and then we're sitting on the plane to go, I thought that was pretty cool. And we spent many years traveling together on the race day express. And those were absolutely, and those were some good times though, you know, they were they weren't easy, but there was a lot, of, <laughs> lot of great, no. lot of great guys, a lot of good teams. You know, you had Robert Yates racing, you had Roush Fenway, or not How was big it Fenway? Was the plane? Um, it was a one. It was a hundred. Was it uh, seven? It's like one hundred sixty-five people. Oh wow, one hundred and fifty yeah. something. It was a bit. It was a boat like a. I tell you what, it was like a seven thirty-seven three hundred. I think something wow. like that. That's a big plane. Yeah, it was a big plane. So it was, it was really teams. a big plane. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, we had guys from. Yeah, Morgan. and what ha what it was was so cool is they sold seats, and so you know, Roush had so many seats, and um, you know, Sabco had so many seats, and Ro Robert Yates Racing had so many seats, and then even like uh, NASCAR would fly Larry McReynolds, um, you know, people like that that work for Fox, they would fly on there, and then mm -hmm. sometimes drivers that didn't have their own planes, they would fly on there. Right. Um. So. It was uh, it was all NASCAR people. That was what made it really cool because you knew every single body. I mean, you you, you know, you'd have Jeff Hammond on there, Joe Nemechek. Uh, sometimes you'd have Jeremy Mayfield flying, and then you'd have Jamie McMurray flying. Uh, you'd have Larry McReynolds. Uh, I mean, I could just go on. And on. Everybody on the pit crews that you you know, piled around with and were mm -hmm. friends with up and down pit road, you flew home with them. So you got to sit there and cut up. And, yep. and if you were one of the lucky ones that won that day and you were on that plane, it was really a special trip yeah. because everybody was congratulating you. Everybody was really happy, you know, mm -hmm. for that person. And you were reliving it, you know, on, you know, talking about the race the whole time on the way home. And it's, it was just a really cool flight. And, I've been on both ends of the spectrum. I've been where we've wrecked in the first six or eight laps, you know, of a race, and yeah. uh, you take a take a little nap in the hauler, and then your your flight home's real quiet. And then there's times when you win, and <clears throat> you know you you can't go to sleep on the plane, and you just sit there and like, wow, we won, you know, kind of deal. So uh, yeah. it's two ends of the spectrum. I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. We <clears throat> traveled a lot. And we were up a lot. You know, the plane left so early in the morning, and we didn't get back till so late at night. So sometimes from start to finish was sometimes 21 hours. 
Yeah, Sometimes was. 22 hours long. I yeah, mean, we, you really counted it. Yeah, we boarded the plane at 5 a.m. <laughs> yeah. that morning. And then, yeah, we, yeah. We, we get home till very late at night. Not, 11, 30, 12. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes if we were lucky, we'd get home at, if they were like an hour behind or something, we would get home at 8 o'clock, you know, 9, 30, 10 mm-hmm. o'clock. And then, you know, we would, it would, the sun would just be setting in the summertime. I remember sometimes we would get home and it would just be like loud, New Hampshire. That was a short race. Remember? Yeah. It was like the slick 50, 300 or something. It's not that long. And I remember we got home at like eight thirty or nine o'clock. It was still sunny, you know, bright. It wasn't even dark yet. And then sometimes you get home at the wee hours of the morning if you're flying like from the West Coast. Yeah, and then you have to you get know, on that bus like that. And, and drive home from the Charlotte Airport from Signature. Mm, there was many times, <laughs> was man, I just sat in my car and would <laughs> and could not even, a, you know, focus yeah. on what was going on and, like, how am I going to drive home? Yeah. Not that I had been drinking or anything like that, but I was so tired. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, I feel sick. I've been up so long, I don't even know oh, if yeah. I can drive home. Yeah, I would wait. It would take me until about Wednesday so. to, to regain my – to quit feeling like a zombie at that point. Were y'all ever on the race sure. day express with people that had been fighting in the infield, like the pit crews? Gosh, oh I'm yeah, there. there was a couple of times. There was <laughs> a, a few there was... times. There was some heated. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. <laughs> there was some heated. Uh, th- yeah, there was some well, times that people Bristol had to be separated on the plane. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah like... And Diane was very good at that. Yeah. She was. <laughs> um, Diane was very good. She was kind of a racer's, uh, a, a racer's woman. You know, she just knew how the racers, our attitudes were, and our, you know, how we reacted to stuff. And she was very good at being able to keep the peace on that plane. So, um, <clears throat> a lot of times, if it something got out of control, it was, mm, you know, mainly a, a shouting match. I don't think I ever saw anybody really go you know, actually go to blows. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did, I had seen some people get up out of their seats during the flight and literally bump forehead to forehead in the, in the aisle. Uh, mm-hmm. so, you know, but hey. that, that happens, you get all those guys on there and everybody's <clears throat> just all adrenaline and, oh, yeah. and just testosterone. And, and you know, <laughs> one thing leads to another. And, tired. and, and um, um, usually that time while you're on the airplane, by then you've done had a few beers in you too, because we're sitting on the bus trying to get out of the, out of the racetrack. <laughs> it's a, well, I didn't know if this was free. a family show or not. I wasn't going to say anything about the beer. <laughs> that's, that's part <laughs> of yes, it, man. When they, you know, when you got a free, you know, you got beer sponsors that yeah. basically, dump two or three cases of you know cases canned of beer of whatever you want on a flight that's not but an hour and a half yeah. you've got people that are drinking it like bottled water i mean they're drinking it just because it's free right you yeah. know how many can i drink in 90 minutes yeah that's what basically was the game mm. uh and i felt sorry for some of those people i can't say that i didn't drink but i never got where i couldn't drive home no you know and i mean these people were just drinking you know, eight, nine, ten beers in a, in a, you know, an hour and a half flight. Yeah. I used like, to, wow. Like I, I would have some on the bus or whatever. And then by the time I got to the airplane, it was like, nah, forget it. Cause you didn't want to have, plus you didn't want to get up and have to go to the bathroom on the airplane and all that. So I was, we well, like, had to be really dehydrated. Oh, well, that, that too. I would have such a headache. Oh probably. my gosh. Dehydrated. Yes. You are so spot on <laughs> with that. Yes. I was always thirsty. Yeah. Always thirsty. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I raced and, I, I swear the the fire suits we wore they they literally sometimes would just suck everything out of me at the end of the day i felt like i weighed 90 pounds oh, yeah. you know i mean sometimes i i really i mean it just was like wow this is insane yeah sure was man. Um, but so uh, yeah. terry says that uh ty norris works for spire entertainment i saw that i'm not sure what the, spire, spire is spire is spire and uh Paul says, I have seen the Ty Norris name around for years, Terry, yes. And uh, Terry says, tell John I sent him pink bunny ears at RYR, and I met him at Yates Open House, and he signed a lug nut for me. 
So you got some pink bunny ears there. See, somewhere. I guess the name, the, yeah, the name. That's what I'm saying. The mm-hmm. Terry, the Terry Quinn name just sounds very familiar to me. So that must be where that's at. Yeah, Tracy says we Tell saw. Her out there, hello. Yeah, he, she, he says hello, Terry Quinn, and uh, Tracy says my wife Tracy. We saw Ernie at the car show that Ralph Sheets had by your work. Yes, and I was. It's, so one of the things that Ernie was telling Tracy was about how we I had these little uh, Pinewood Derby cars. And I wasn't telling Ernie my secrets because my son's car spanked his, <laughs> spanked Jared's his son's uh, car. So Ernie made it's kind of funny. Ernie made like three little Pinewood Derby cars, okay. And I made one, and I made it. I added sorry, I added a half an inch onto my car. My car was this zoom right down the track. We ended up winning Did you the whole thing. Not have a template; it had to fit. Well, I had a rule book or rules, okay. And when, when I, yes, and when I have rules, I can <laughs> just kind of. So my car ended up being within twenty thousand, ten to twenty thousandths of the maximum length of the car. So he made his the box, the little uh, block of wood that they give you, mm-hmm. and balsa wood. Yeah, the little balsa wood. He he made his that length, and he used the axles. All right. So what I did was I took mine, I made it to the exact maximum length that it could make within about ten thousandths. And uh, I know this sounds crazy. And <laughs> I think it's hilarious. I, uh, I put it up in a mill, and I drilled my own holes for the axles, and I offsetted one about 20 thousandths. That way it can run down the track on three wheels. And uh, with it making the longest length that you possibly can, that helped it to go str- in a straight line. So whenever I got it to there and to the place, they had this template box. And you go, I went to set the car in the template box, and it wouldn't fit. And I'm like, your box is wrong. <laughs> so one of the guys had a set of 12 inch calipers in his car. He went out and got it. He went and measured a box and sure enough, the box was too short. So yeah. <laughs> that is a great, that's a really great story. Oh yeah. So we ended up, yeah. So that's pretty good. And there Ernie was with three, three cars and his would go down the track and it was just like wobbling back and forth. Auto racing taste, auto racing, um, makes you learn a lot about math. Yeah, it does. Well, and me being an engine yes, motor, so I definitely, I didn't work with a tape measure. I worked with, you know, micrometers and I used to calibers, help, so. have to help the guy do fractions with the tire pressures and stuff. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Oh, very cool. <laughs> yes. Very cool. Uh, so, uh, Tracy says, yeah, David can find all the ways to get around the rules. Yeah. Every time I do something, I'm like, do you have a rule book? Because I want to read this. I want to see if there's... If you had, if you well, noticed, I mean, yeah. there's no, yeah, you you need to be able to know yeah. how far you can push the limit, you know, so, I mean, why not have a rule book? That's right. There's always a gray area. Yeah. I mean, you know. Robert, Absolutely. There's always a loophole. Yeah. Robert Yates is one of the best at that, I'd say. Yes. Oh, and, yes. We, we used to have some good times there. That was, that was, yeah, Robert taught you know, everybody that ever, I guess, taught everybody that he came in contact with something, uh, you know, it, whether it was engine wise, just on life in general, but that was, you know, still is today probably by far the best man I've ever worked for ever. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, by far, and I've worked for a lot of people, not just in racing, but I've had a lot of bosses, you know, and he was a really good one. i there is not a thing I can say wrong about him at all. Yeah. He was good to his people. He, you know, he took care of everybody. Um, he, he was old school, but he, he was, he was new school too. If that's the way to say it, he, um, he, he knew how to take care of his people. And that was the most important thing. He could not stand for someone to have a problem at home. You know, from either traveling too much or, you know, being away from their family. And he knew that because he had been in their shoes. Yeah. You know, he always could relate, you know, to people that were married. You know, I wasn't married at the time, so it was a lot easier for me to travel and do things. And it wasn't, you know, I didn't have kids, so there wasn't a, a big, you know, tug of war uh, there. And Robert was big on, you know, telling people, you know, make sure you spend time with your family. And he gave people... You know, the guys on the road crew, there's like the, you know, the A-team back then, and a lot of people don't even know what I'm talking about, but mm-hmm. like the A-team back then, they, you know, they got Monday and Tuesday off. Um, you know, just the B-team uh, just got Monday off. And so, but he, he knew that he had to give back for him to get. 
you know, what he needed to out of everybody on that race team. And he was, he probably paid more money per person in there than most guys up and down pit road did at that time when I was there, Mm -hmm. because I, I, you know, he just, he took care of his people because he didn't want you to have any struggles at home. And so he compensated that, you know, with, with a monetary value. So, um, you know, and he made, made life easy for me, you know, when I was young and I, you know, I enjoyed every bit of it. And, but, um, yeah, that was, I think that's probably the feather in my cap is being able to honestly say I work for Robert, you know, and around him and on that race team and stuff. And those were just good times. I was very fortunate to be able to do that for so long. Yeah, for sure, man. I was, uh, you know, yeah. I got in there. I worked for, for that company for 16 years. Uh, but, you know, before yeah. before that, I had I had thought about it at times because Nick Ramey would say, hey, would you ever thought about coming and working for – Robbery H racing. And I was like, well, I'm used to working on Chevrolet. So I, you know, I haven't really thought about it too much. I didn't know it'd be, you know, <laughs> what kind of transition it would be. Uh, it's always got to be Chevrolet and Ford. It's just always got to be that. <laughs> well, you know, I went from there, I went to uh, work for Carl Wagner for one year building Chevrolets. And then I went up to Bill Davis racing also Chevrolet. And then, so then I was like, you know, I got the call from uh, Joel Goodman over there at, Ralph, at Robert Yates Racing. And he's like, hey, I want you to come uh, build engines. We don't normally hire people to come build engines, but I know I know your reputation and I know, you know, you're good. You could do it, whatever. So I said, you know what, I want to get back to Mooresville because I was driving to High Point every day. And I said, I don't want to do that anymore. So, And then, plus it was more money. So I was like, heck yeah, that's a win-win situation. And I never regretted making that decision because that was a, like you said, that's a great, a great family to work for. I mean, Doug. Well, it's just what you just said. Mm -hmm. 16 years, man. That says a lot. Yeah, it for sure. You know, it does. It says a lot. And I, I'm telling you, I've worked for Doug when that was basically when I say that Doug was small time. (laughs) Yeah. You know what I mean? He He just, he just was in charge of the end of shop. He kind of helped run the dyno, but between Jeff Clark and Steve Allen and, and, and Larry Lackey and, and Luter and, and all of those people that I remember working around him and Tim Lancaster and Steve uh, Allen. Uh, Brett, Brett Conway. And I mean, all of those people back in the machine shop and stuff. But now I knew Doug was going to be, was going to do great things. You could tell back then, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. He, he just had, he was focused and he had his, his mindset on the way he wanted to do it. And that's, uh, that's basically, you know, he took it and stop. stop. Yeah. He had a lot of ambition and he was smart. Oh, <laughs> Absolutely. He? <laughs> he had, a, he, he wanted to take what Robert had built and take it to the next level, you know, no matter what that in, in entailed. And, you know, of course, Doug never knew that the race team was going to, shut down eventually and then you know robert was going to go on and you know later on and get sick and stuff but i think doug is exactly where he he needs to be you know it's amazing how that that all kind of comes together and i think doug is is doing exactly what he's doing he is he loves the challenge he he loves to be challenged Mm -hmm. uh, especially this whole thing when y'all converted, you know, from carburetors over fuel injection and all that, he just took that as like, Oh heck yeah, man. I'm, I'm all about that. Let's, oh, yeah. let's dig in. Yeah. You know, so, um, Doug's always been like that. And, um, I know that he is, he pushes people, you know, hard. Um, he will get out of you what you never really thought you could get out of yourself, whether yeah. it's work wise um, working efficiency, you know, um, when you're there, do it, you know, and when you're, you're not go home and have fun kind of deal. Right. So I've, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from Doug, even though him and I are kind of in the same age bracket, but (laughs) I learned a lot from, from working around Doug. I know one thing, whenever we would have an engine blow up or any, any kind of, if we didn't finish the race very good, he would be the first one there the next morning and he'd be walking through the shop. Just, he's got to just keep digging and do some things to make things better, yeah. you know, always make things better. 
I just noticed I didn't turn well, on the little what, lights. The stage lights aren't on. Anyway. That's what Robert that's what Robert would do. He would he was always like four steps ahead of you in the thought process. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. If that makes any sense. He had already kind of you know, got there like you said, was mm-hmm. the first person there. He's already looked at the car. You know, because he wanted them unloaded as soon as the trucks got there. Yeah. And he's in the bay. You know, he's in the wash bay. And he's looking at the cars, and he's trying to figure out what this is and what that is and why the fender was like that and all that. And that's before anybody ever even gets there. And he's already got this whole analysis of what's happened, what's happened, figured it out, figured out kind of how he can put his two cents in and we can fix it and, you know, dig on. And that is Mm -hmm. just. That's just in their blood. Like, Doug got that straight from Robert. Oh, yeah. I mean, because, you know, D- Robert was the same way. I mean, the exact same way. I remember driving an engine, I am not lying, from Atlanta Motor Speedway in a, you know, one of the Ford vans, you know, the Econo line vans. Oh, yeah. Of course, we used to take the back two rows out because Doug had to have engines and oh, stuff. Yeah. And that's when we used to run them all the time, and you had practice engines and stuff like this. Well, one had – we – the race was over on Sunday, and we blew right before, like, eight laps to go, okay? Mm-hmm. Well, he gets the engine, and Nick, Ramey, and all those guys, they take the engine out. And this was out of the 28, I think. Yeah, it was out of the 28 car. Yeah. And tells me that – He's going to put it in his van, and I'm going to drive it back. And Brian Clark, the, you know, you mentioned him earlier. He right. was with me. Uh, he was my riding partner. Yeah. So him and I jumped in the van. The The engine's still hot. I mean, it's just hot from the race. <laughs> right. We drive it all the way home. It's still hot, okay? <laughs> we pull in, and Doug is at the shop. This is when we used to be right by Marita Bread off of 85. Um, right there on Brookshire. Oh, yeah. And so, and I remember pulling in, and he's opening up the big, huge door for me to back in in the engine shop so they can unload it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Doug, are you going to go home? Well, I'm going to go ahead and take, you know, go ahead and break this motor down, get the valve covers off, da 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 you know, the manifold. You know, and I was like, oh, my gosh. He goes, no, but y'all go on home, you know, and everything. And I'll, I'll never forget that as long as I live. The motor was still warm when we got there, and that was, what, a four-hour drive, four-and-a-half-hour drive? <laughs> yeah. Something like that from yeah. Atlanta. Mm-hmm. I, and I'll never forget it. I mean, he says, just, you know, don't – he goes, don't, you know, kill yourself. Stop getting something to eat. He goes, but I'll be waiting on you. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. I'm, time you get out of here and get on the plane and get – you." yeah, and he was there. Sure enough. Ready to go. Sure enough. Yeah, man. And I, I mean, I should have really have never expected anything less from him. But that's what I'm saying. Doug's just a few steps ahead of everybody. He always has been. He, I think he makes it a point to be. Yeah, usually you and there's the, not, uh, the, the sons of people like that, you know, like Robert Yates and whatever, you hear that, they, yeah, they end up being kind of flunkies or whatever, but, you know, not Doug Yates. Robert knew what he was doing when he raised him, for sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, that's um, – that's why they were very, very hard to beat mm-hmm. when they were together. And when Robert was really in his prime in those 90s there, when Ernie was coming back, and Davey, of course, but when Ernie was coming back from his wreck and stuff, Robert was really, really clicking on all eight cylinders. Mm-hmm. And and he had Doug in there, and him and Doug were grinding it out and trying new things and you know trying new cam combinations and all kinds of different stuff, and those are the days that I remember. Like when everybody else was going home, you know, Robert's walking in the back door with Bojangles, and him and Doug and mm-hmm. Steve Allen and Jeff are fixing to run these two engines that are going to go into '88 and the '28, and then we're we're talking like seven thirty, eight o'clock at night, right? And they've already been there since six thirty that morning. Yeah. Gosh. So, I, remember. I mean, they used to put the hours in. I'm oh, like, yeah. God. I remember being down at Myrtle I'm Beach. I'm going home. Being down at uh, Myrtle Beach whenever Ernie got in that wreck. I remember hearing about it in Michigan. and Because uh, I was a big Ernie Urban fan back then. And uh, But, yeah, they powered through it. I mean, hell, they got it. They got everything. 
you know, and it made them stronger. I think, you know, between going through what they went through with Davy Allison passing away, you know, those things, um, gosh, they went through so much. And it was kind of, uh, you know, whenever we had our reunion over there at the, uh, uh, Bobby, um, in the, in the race shop over there, you know what I'm talking about? Bobby Benton. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, Mm -hmm. he was telling a story about, it was kind of funny. He started talking about Davy Allison and it was like, he was talking about his son, you know, right then. And then, uh, and then sure. Doug, Doug was like, Hey, what about me, dad? You know? <laughs> oh, but yeah. Yeah. Davey, Davey was, uh, Davey was like a son to him. No doubt. He, yeah. they had a special bond. I don't know if it was because of Robert and Bobby, you know, Allison's yeah. relationship. And he just kind of maybe was had, you know, like Bobby, I'm going to take care of your son kind of deal, you know, because Bobby had, you know, Robert had built engines for Bobby. They had won, if I'm not mistaken, a Daytona 500. I had won some races, you know, with, with that, um, Robert's engines. Mm -hmm. Um, so I I think he took a personal thing to that, Mm -hmm. you know, and was like, Hey, I'm going to take care of him. And then when that happened, uh, and he got, you know, Robert was just, he was devastated, really. I mean, a lot of people thought Robert was going to fold then, you right. know, and get out and this and that. But he dug his heels in. You know, he got Ernie, you know, and then Ernie almost gets killed, you know, a few years, a couple of years later. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I think made Ernie confident and strong is when he came back, you know, he had to drive with that patch for a while. Yeah. And... I think that gave him confidence knowing that not only can he, com- he can compete again and he has physically came back from the, you know, the wreck and whatnot, but mentally he was literally out driving probably 80% of the field at that time. Um, I mean, he was leading races and won races, you know, with mm-hmm. that patch. Uh, on, and, um, you know, he's the one that kind of invented the spot mirror on the left side. Mm -hmm. He kind of came up with that because he couldn't see so that he used that. Um, you know, so, um, Ernie was a a great, a great one, you know, too. I, I, politics, people have to move on. You know, he went on and drove for, you know, MBV two and the Skittles car. And we wound up getting Ernie, I mean, uh, Kenny Irwin, Mm -hmm. you know, it took over, um, and his spot, and then eventually Ricky Rudd. It's funny how it's a circle sometimes in NASCAR. It's yeah. Kind of, oh, yeah. You know, once you're in, you're in kind of deal. And, you know, be nice to everybody because you will see them again. And so here comes Ricky Rudd uh, driving the 28 car where I had just, you know, worked with him yep. basically like seven years before that. Mm-hmm. Yep, for and sure. so that was a nice reunion. It was cool having him come drive the car. We were at uh, Norman. I guess it was Norman Kazumishi's uh, memorial service, and uh, I was out there talking to Ricky Rudd, and then uh, you know Larry Lackey comes up, and they look like they're gonna face off into each other. Fent, you know, got their <laughs> thumbs up or their, their mm-hmm. yeah, you know, they're gonna box or something. But uh, Ernie come mm-hmm. in, er, Ernie come in and sat beside me, and we were talking about. I said, "What do you think is the uh, the biggest difference between you and your son Jared?" And he said, "Well." When he drives, he's got he's kind of like got some sense about him. He said, "When I was driving, he says I just didn't care. I was just gonna <laughs> go all out, you know." And uh, so awesome. I could see that with Ernie. You know, he's, he's <laughs> wide open. And even after his accident, yeah. when he come back, you know, it's like wow. But I would have. Like, he is. Uh, you always knew, like Larry McReynolds said, "There's one thing that you have to love about old Ern. You knew what kind of race car you had in the first thirty laps." <laughs> That's because good. That's there was no hey hey it's 500 miles <laughs> take care of the car ernie literally would when they dropped the green it was he had the he, he treated the first lap like the last lap hmm. and he raced like that all the time i mean you know i remember richmond was so hard on brakes so hard on brakes and oh, yeah. it wouldn't be but 80 laps into that race, you know, a 400-lap race, and he, his, you know, rotors were glowing. Yeah. It gets uh, a lot so of fires. it's like, Ernie, you've got to lay off of it. But he was running, you know, running down the leaders or leading the race. Yeah. But that's just how Ernie drove. He just drove so hard <laughs> down into the corner, you know, and, and basically slammed on the brakes. 
to get it to stop, and then he'd mat the gas again. That's just how he drove. Yeah. It was aggressive. And it, and it worked for him. His own nickname uh, with the you know, it, it, Swerving Irvin. Swerving Irvin. I remember that. <laughs> I liked him when he yep. was with the Kodak, the four car. So I liked him all through the years. And and whenever he was yep. in the Skittles car, a lot of times he was back there in, in the garage right beside us, you know, because I was with Sterling in those years. And mm-hmm. uh, and he was mm-hmm. right there. So I would always go and talk to him about every week. He was basically my neighbor yep. in my neighborhood over there in Mooresville. So. I just don't hear enough cool. people was, tell yeah. me to mash the gas in my life anymore. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> you just don't hear that phrase mash anymore. Mash the gas. Mash yeah. the gas. Oh, yeah. So we have some comments on here. Dickie right. Dennis yeah. says, I love learning the ins and outs of NASCAR. Uh, Steve Baker, they're, these are two both in Virginia. He says, uh, if he does all the time, even bring these guys back, this will take off. I'm not sure what he, uh, But the, uh, they're saying basically they love this chat and they love hearing the ins and outs of the history of NASCAR and uh yeah because we're all old and we're all yeah we're all old and talking about i can't it. speak for you john but yeah richard bain did, yeah. did Mark. <laughs> Absolutely. richard bain and then yeah. uh super jason's joined us hello super jason but yeah all of our friends on here tuning in and they're enjoying this chat so uh but thank you so much good deal man john <laughs> you know if you uh absolutely i appreciate you i appreciate you having me on man i'll uh i'll definitely you know Call back at another time. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll chat some more. Hopefully, we can get you up here sometime and get uh, Beer Man in here. We'll just have us a yeah. we'll just have us a two hour session and just roll with it. Woo! We'll get stuff. Man, we'll have to get bottled waters in there and the whole nine yards, won't yeah. we? Yeah, we will for sure. And I, as I said, I'm gonna have uh, <laughs> I'll have uh, Brad Perry on next Monday. He's gonna come in because he he just lives like four miles from my house where I live up here in Statesville. So, well, that's uh, you need to. You need to have him on. He mm-hmm. would be a hoot. Yeah, sure. Looking forward to it. Yeah. 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 All right, buddy. We'll... All right, man. We'll take care. And yeah. uh, you guys you guys have a good night. It was uh, great talking to you. Yeah, man. Great talking to you, too, as always. Thanks, See... John. All right. See you, buddy. See Bye. ya. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. That was John Bryan, one of my good all-time friends from, uh, gosh, we started working together, I would say, probably around 1990, 91. Maybe 92. It's probably more like 92. Yeah. So I've known him that long, and he's been through. Uh, we traveled together for many years in racing and NASCAR, of course, in the Cup Series. And so, yeah, he's got a lot of he's got a lot more stories to tell. I can tell. Yeah, John's a great guy. He was, Everybody always, has stories. That's what. Yeah. That's why NASCAR is so great. Yeah. Because everybody has stories. Yeah, I would say he he's one, he's probably one of my all time all time best friends as far as in NASCAR too. So, and I didn't get into the story about whenever he was flying it back from one of the races. This was like the year before I got in NASCAR, whenever they had the big wreck, uh, the plane crash at the Charlotte uh, airport. Oh, in July? Yeah, it was something like that. And July 4th. His plane like flew in right after that. And I was down at my parents' house, and they lived beside the airport. And I had just left, and I was driving around the airport, and it was just like all hell broke loose. The clouds just, I mean, it was like bad rain and stuff. And apparently that that was right when that airplane accident happened because my mom called me right after that. And it's like, we just had a plane crash right next to us. Yep. And then John was telling me a story before that his plane landed right after that one. You know what I was doing when that plane crashed? What's that? I was at a volleyball game with Dale Jr. Oh, yeah. Volleyball? Volleyball? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Out on Lake Norman. Oh, okay. He was friends of some friends. He was like 15 or 16 at the time. Okay. Yeah, it was a long time Showing ago. That age. was the first time. Shut up. I know. That was the first time I met him. <laughs> yes. Well, that's cool. I yeah. think he was still in military school at that point. How old is Ham? Somebody says, uh, Steve Baker says, or Dickie Dennis says, how old is Ham? You know Dickie Dennis? He's the one that climbed a fence at Richmond in 2014. I know. You know, we, talked, we talked about that on the last show. Yes. And uh, how old is Ham? I am 49 years old. 49 years young. I haven't made it to the hill yet. I'm almost 10 years older than you. Yes. <laughs> really God, that yes. much okay oh thanks ham well i, I mean honest i don't know i wasn't thinking that i thought you were my age i always had much now. younger boyfriends yes oh i see that's what that's how you do it mm-hmm. yes i can't say the same thing but yeah okay i would say my wife's younger than me she looks younger than me how's that sound you're Is like she not maybe younger not. than you oh maybe that's not. good oh i should have worn my shirt yes yeah, you should have maybe not yeah next time you You'll need to, to wear me back next time you wear your maybe not shirt 
All right, so let's wrap it up. I'd say let's do. I have to go home and eat. All right, so everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, go on my website, dhamiam.com, and you can find me at dhamiam, pretty much everything. Just do a Google search. And that's it. So we uh, thank thanks you so much. Thanks for having me. Don Clark, the one and only. You didn't even tell anybody how you knew me. Well, I know you from the to be Tom friends. Dooley play. From the Tom Dooley play. Yes. Yeah. She did such a fantastic job. We have job. to get a plug in for that since we didn't get to do it this year. I know. And I, yes. Hopefully we'll get to do it again. She did such a fantastic job in uh, the Tom Dooley play. She was the, an actress extraordinary. Yeah. I'm really doing, this is my fangirl moment tonight though, because I've hung out with you guys for so long. I've never gotten to like sit in the seat with the headphones oh. and the microphone yes. and stuff. It's very cool. Well, now you're like a pro, a pro at it. So, you know, have me back. Yeah. I promise I, I won't talk yeah. about stupid stuff. Oh, uh, just don't was, give me bourbon first. No, <laughs> <laughs> no bourbon. Yes. Or Sailor Jerry's anything. Uh, I did want to say Ray, you know, Ray Lee, uh, Wood was, he passed away. He was 92 years old. I think it was. And, uh, he was with the original Wood families, uh, Wood, Wood family, the, uh, Wood brothers in NASCAR. And so, yeah, I'm going to, I'll do a little uh, write up about him. So at some point. And, uh, so anyway, uh, condolences to his family and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, cause he was one of the founding members, the, uh, the pit crew, the old Wood Brothers pit crew yeah. that you'd hear about for many years. 21 right. car. Yes. The 21 car for sure. And, uh, that was one of my favorite cars back in the day. Mine too. Yeah. Cause it was David Pearson, the I know, 21, I the it. silver Fox. Love yes. Those guys. Uh, but you know, we're going to have a show here on Wednesday night. It's going to be the Piedmont Folkway radio show. And I'll be sitting right here running the board and we're going to have uh, Jason Wood and Danny Wicker. It's going to be mostly bluegrass and Piedmont blues kind of music and stuff. If so, you've never heard Danny Wicker and Jason Wood, it's worth oh yeah, so, tuning in. Yeah, check it out. It's on uh, WME Radio, Facebook, or Instagram. YouTube now. Gosh, why did I see Instagram? I, I'm I getting know, so far just, out there. D Hamo. Well, you're Instagram. everywhere, Danny. I, I'm everywhere. Yes, that's for sure. So, with well, WME Radio on YouTube and also on Facebook. And you can find it there, and we're going to be here in the studio, and we're going to be playing some good music, as always. I'll be in the audience this time. Yes, there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, and uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we will see you all next Monday evening. I'm sure I'll probably see you Wednesday evening, Thursday and Friday, right here on the WME Radio on YouTube. So you all have a great evening, and thanks again.